Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deepa. I'm currently undergoing my MFM training. So I've been asked to talk about these three riveting cases in obstetric medicine. Uh, so what I'm going to do is basically go through three case studies. And after each case study, I'll be talking about uh, the discussion points that I would like to bring up pertaining to the case management. So I'm going to move on to the first case. Uh, so this is a 43-year-old, Gravida 3 para 1 uh, plus 1 at 11 weeks one day. So this patient had a STEMI in June 2020 prior to her current pregnancy. Uh, she then completed dual antiplatelet therapy for six months, and her repeated echo in April 2021 was normal with an ejection fraction of 70%. Uh, her additional risk factors include type 2 diabetes on treatment, where her sugars is well controlled, and her ophthalmology and renal assessment is normal. She's also got dyslipidemia, but she's not on treatment because as you can see here, her blood investigations are fairly good. So what I would like to bring up with this study is if you've got a patient who has a STEMI in a previous pregnancy and currently she's pregnant and asymptomatic, so what will you do for this patient? Would you straight away start her on antiplatelet therapy? Uh, if you're starting her on antiplatelet therapy, would you consider dual antiplatelet therapy? Okay, uh, in this case, would you consider uh, doing an angiogram, okay, to assess her condition prior to uh, deciding what to do with her. So the points that I would like to bring up is if you're planning for an angioplasty, is it safe during pregnancy? Okay, and if you're planning to intervene during this current pregnancy, uh, what are the diff different stents that is available? Okay, the drug eluting stents versus the bare metal stents, which is preferable in pregnancy. Also, if you're planning to start dual antiplatelet therapy, is it safe during pregnancy? So with percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, we know that it has ionizing radiation expo exposure and also contrast agents used. So what is the safety uh, issues with regards to this? Also, with the different arterial access, radial artery access versus femoral artery access, is there a difference when you use the different arterial access? Also, like I said before, if you're using a stent, which is preferable in a pregnant lady, okay? So with PCI, okay, uh, evidence has shown that radial approach is actually preferable, okay, because it is associated with decreased bleeding complications, reduced length of hospital stay and improved patient comfort. In fact, femoral, femoral artery entry uh, has direct pelvic radiation, and obviously it's uh, technically more challenging in an obstetric population. With regards to ionizing radiation exposure, uh, the mean radiation of an unsheltered abdomen is actually just about 1.5 millipave, which is far lower than the reported dose associated with miscarriages and fetal malformation. Uh, in fact, I mean, if you're moving on and to do an intervention for this patient, for example, if you're planning an angioplasty, obviously the radiation exposure is increased, but even then it's been reported an angioplasty is uh, probably uh, giving only about three milligray uh, radiation exposure. And as you can see, it's far lower than the uh, dangerous doses. Ionated contrast use, well, we know it crosses the placenta. However, limited evidence is available to suggest direct teratogenic effects to the fetus. And even with the risk of congenital hypothyroidism, so far no serious neonatal hypothyroidism uh, risk has been reported. And however, we have to note that the evidence for this is actually scarce. Okay, with regards to uh, stand use in uh, pregnancy, so you've got two kinds of stand that is available for the non obstetric population. So you've got your drug eluting stands and your bare metal stands. So drug eluting stands, uh, what it does is it emits this medication. Okay, usually they use pectic texan or cyrolimus. Basically, this medication is important to prevent restenosis of that vessel, the affected vessel. Okay, but with drug eluting stents, what they have found is over the years, what they realized is although it prevents restenosis in the initial stages, however, the use has been associated with uh, increased rate of uh, late restenosis. So if, if a clinician is uh, giving someone drug eluting stents, uh, usually what they do is they start that person 
uh, on dual antiplatelet therapy for at least six months. So in these kind of cases, what they do is basically bare metal stents are used for patients who are deemed higher risk of uh, bleeding tendency or if they're planning to go for a surgery. Because when someone gets a bare metal stents, usually the dual antiplatelet therapy is continued for one month. So for now, most clinicians will start bare, will use sorry will use bare metal stents for obstetric patients. Uh, however, again, the evidence for this is scarce and more research is obviously needed to decide which is best for the patient. So as much as now we know that uh, angiogram is safe in pregnancy, we still should try our best to minimize, minimize radiation dose to the bare minimum. So how can we do that? Okay, as you can see here in the green box, what you can do is you can use echo guidance where possible. Place the source as distant as possible from the patient and the receiver as close as possible. Use low dose fluoroscopy. Minimize fluoroscopy time. Favor AP projections. Avoid direct radiation of the abdomen. Uh, collimate as tightly, collimate or rather focus as tightly as possible to the area of interest. And of course, with all obstetric uh, patients, uh, when you're doing a procedure, tilt the patient to the left to reduce IVC compression and have a peripartum cesarean section kit in hand. So what about this blue box here, PCI in PSCAD? So what PSCAD stands for is basically spontaneous coronary artery duct section in pregnancy. So before I can explain this, I just want to quickly go through my next slide to explain uh, to you about it. So I'm not sure whether you've heard about the term Minuka. So Minuka is basically MI with non-obstructive in a non-obstructive coronary artery. Okay, so uh, basically when you're talking about MI, you're talking about MI with obstructed coronary arteries and non-obstructed coronary arteries. Okay, so the most common cause of an MI with non-obstructed coronary arteries is actually your coronary artery sections. Coronary embolism and vasopressin is quite rare, so I'm going to focus more on these coronary artery dissections. Okay, why we need to know this? Because studies have shown that coronary artery dissection is becoming more uh, common in pregnant population, especially in the third trimester and in the pubertal periods. So if you have someone coming in with an MI in third trimester and a, a pubertal period, please think about uh, non-obstructed coronary arteries, uh, especially coronary artery dissection. Why is this important? Because obviously, diagnosis is more challenging. Okay, uh, Using angiogram uh, for these kind of patients is a bit more difficult. Okay, Actually, it's not a bit, uh, quite difficult. Because what, your, what is your concern is basically when you're putting in the catheter, you're actually going through the false lumen rather than the true lumen. And when you do this, you can actually potentially worsen the dissection. Okay, management for these patients are also a bit more challenging because obviously in this case, while the medical thrombolysis, while thrombolysis can actually resolve the hematoma, what it can also do is also, also uh, lies the hematoma that is forming in between the torn vessels. And this, if it happens, can actually further cause further dissection uh, and worsening the maternal condition, causing collapse. Okay. So how does uh, coronary artery dissection happen? So as you can see on the diagram uh, uh, over the left here, uh, you can see a normal coronary artery uh, anatomy. Okay, so what happens is there's a sudden internal tear in the coronary wall resulting in blood flow under the tunica intima. Okay, so this causes accumulation and propagation of blood forming a false lumen in the tunica media. This results in an intramural hematoma, which cause luminal compression and obstruction leading to an MI. So as you can see here, why thrombolysis, medical thrombolysis is not really advisable because you know, you're actually lysing the hematoma that's forming in the true lumen, but you're also lysing the hematoma is that is formed between the damaged vessels. And if that has lysed, what it happens is the dissection will just worsen and this can cause maternal collapse. Okay, so why is it challenging? So that's why we need to know when it's challenging to do an angiogram for this kind of patient, there are certain things that we can do to reduce the risk of further dissection in this patient. So in this kind of patients, you may consider femoral excess rather than your radial excess, okay? And when you're putting in the catheter, you need to actually uh, confirm the true lumen using intravascular ultrasound, or you can also use the optical CT, okay? And in this kind of patients, consider using longer stents rather than shorter stents. 
So in summary, what I will say is this box actually summarizes quite well. So pregnancy, we know, increases the risk of acute MI by three to fourfold, yet the diagnosis is not suspected as often as it should be. Uh, coronary artery dissection is the most common cause of acute MI in pregnancy, and it tends to occur mainly in late pregnancy and the early postpartum period. So we now know PCI is not contraindicated in pregnancy and is safe and should be performed when clinically indicated. So although the radiation dose is significantly less than reported to be harmful, efforts should be made to keep the dose as low as possible. Uh, at the moment, there's no current recommendation on the optimal management of uh, non-obstructed coronary artery uh, MI, uh, but this is also obviously uh, subject to further research. So uh, that concludes the first presentation. I'm going to move on to my second presentation. Okay, so this is case study number two. So this is Madam NA. She's a 27-year-old bride to Parazu plus one at six weeks, five days. So this lady had a septal defect closure and a mitral valve repair done in 1998. She then underwent uh, a replacement uh, with the 25 mm jute mechanical valve uh, in 2016, to which she was started on lifelong warfarin. And at booking, she was on warfarin 6 mg per day with a latest INR of 2.5. So this patient is asymptomatic, so it's got no bleeding tendencies. Her examination findings are normal, apart from a sternal tummy scar and a metallic click over the mitral region. So upon further assessment, her ultrasound scan showed thickened ET with an extra uterine gestational sac over the right side, measuring 1.5 times 2 cm. Her left ovary was normal and there was no free fluid. So basically, we have this patient who's got a mechanical uh, mitral valve and she's on warfarin. Okay, so now you have a patient who has stable uh, unruptured ectopic pregnancy. So what would you do for this patient? Okay, so the options are you might want to withhold the warfarin and then do the surgery when the INR is less than 1.5. So some of us may want to bridge her with heparin and then do the surgery. So, and some of us may want to consider the other methods of managing ectopic as she's asymptomatic um, by using MTX or um, observation um, surveillance with beta HCG. Okay, so in this case, what I would like to highlight is basically a high-risk patients like it. What are the options of anticoagulant regimes uh, available? Okay, uh, I'm not here to tell you which is far more superior than the other. Rather, I'm going to provide the evidence to show the pros and cons of each regimes because bearing in mind all patients are different and basically this is for you to decide which will be best for your patient. Okay, some clinicians are moving forward and uh, using heparin instead of warfarin nowadays and they prefer low molecular weight heparin. So if you're using low molecular weight heparin, what are the things that we can do to ensure therapeutic anticoagulation for these high-risk patients? Okay, so the dilemma of anticoagulants is that it's different regimes, okay, we have to understand whatever evidence that is out there is basically based on case uh, series and case reports, okay. So some clinicians like to use warfarin, okay, prefer to use warfarin up to 36 weeks, and then they switch it to unfractionate heparin in preparation for delivery. Okay, obviously warfarin has way higher, uh, way higher uh, benefits in terms of anticoagulant anticoagulating the patient. However, obviously this comes with uh, uh, fetal complications, okay, for example, in miscarriages and embryopathy. Okay, so other patients, other clinicians, sorry, uh, prefer using heparin in the first trimester, followed by warfarin, and then switching it back to heparin uh, at 36 weeks, okay. Uh, low molecular weight heparin have the added advantage of, you know, you can actually prescribe it subcutaneously, so you don't really need uh, prolonged hospital uh, admission like unfractional heparin where you need to give it intravenously. And low molecular weight heparin has the added advantage of uh, not causing the heparin in this thrombocytopenia and risk of osteoporosis. So this paper is basically a systemic review of all the literature that is out there uh, with regards to anticoagulation of pregnant women with uh, mechanical heart valves. Okay, so you, as you can see here, basically there's uh, several regimes uh, that we can use. So basically regime one is just oral anticoagulants. Regime two is heparin in first trimester, and then they switch to oral anticoagulants. Regime three is heparin throughout, and regime four is uh, no anticoagulation, or some give antiplatelet uh, agents. So what I would like to bring up here is you can see here, obviously with the re uh, first regime, which is just your warfarin, your risk of a thromboembolic complication and maternal death is obviously 
less the least lah compared to the other regimes. Okay, whereas when you're seeing uh, your fetal complications, uh, as you can see here, uh, obviously uh, when we're talking about fetal anomalies, warfarin will have the highest risk. And the moment you switch it to heparin in your first trimester, or if you're using heparin throughout, the risk of anomalies reduced uh, drastically. Okay. So, uh, like I said before, uh, this is basically the different regimes, but now many clinicians are actually, many obstetricians actually are moving towards using heparin, particularly low molecular weight heparin when managing this high risk patient. But the concerns with low molecular weight heparin in those days were uh, what they realized is patient, when they are started on low molecular weight heparin, many patients are actually getting uh, thromboembolic events. Okay, so what we have moved forward and did was uh, we started measuring peak anti 10 e levels, okay, instead of just starting them on uh, a blanket roof of tre treatment dose. Okay, so we start them on plexane and then we measure the peak anti 10 e levels. But what Colin and his colleagues have uh, uh, actually found out was actually just measuring peak anti 10 e levels itself is not enough. Okay, what they suggest is to also measure the trough levels. Trough levels meaning the least levels of the uh, peak and the 10A uh, levels, okay? So what they say is peak and the 10A measurements itself for monitoring is inadequate, okay? So this suggests actually measuring the trough levels as well. Okay, why is this? Because as you can see here, so this diagram explains it very clearly. So what it shows is basically a percentage of subtherapeutic trough levels according to peak and the 10A level categories. So as you can see here, the peak anti tiny levels is in your excesses, okay? So basically, uh, when we are starting someone with vaccine, okay, we want to achieve a peak anti tiny level of 0 0.7 to 1.2, okay? So the excesses is basically your peak anti tiny level and your y-axis is the percentage of sub-therapeutic trough anti tiny levels, okay? So what this figure shows us here is, although they are achieving... All these patients basically have achieved peak anti tiny levels, adequate peak anti tiny levels, right? So as you can see here, even have they have achieved the peak anti tiny levels, a large majority of them, when it's between 0 0.7 and 0 0.9, a large proportion of them still has have subtherapeutic trough anti tiny levels. Okay, so this is a bit concerning because uh, it gives us a false impression that these patients are receiving adequate anticoagulation. So when we have this additional information of the uh, trough levels, what we realize is we have to indeed catch up and actually increase the, the dosage of the low molecular weight heparin in order for the patients to receive adequate anticoagulation effect. All right. So what about warfarin? Uh, shall we completely dis disregard the warfarin then because of its fetal effects, okay? So actually for some patients, you still may want to consider warfarin, especially for higher risk patients, okay? For example, patients who have the older generation valves, uh, like your ball cage valve, okay? So these older generation valves are at increased risk of a thromboembolic event. So in this kind of patients, you may want to consider warfarin, okay? Also patients with dual valves, that means dual valves being involved, you have two valves in their heart. So in those kind of patients also, it's higher risk of thromboembolic events. So you may want to start warfarin for those. The location of the valve, if it's in the mitral and tricuspid region, it's at higher risk of thromboembolic uh, event compared to it being in the aortic or pulmonary area. Okay, presence of arrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation, okay, and also previous thrombosis. So for this group of patients, you may want to consider warfarin. Okay, so moving on to my next slide. So this paper, on the other hand, actually examines a very interesting association. So what it does, it, it proves that actually uh, warfarin, the effect of warfarin is actually dose dependent. Okay, so what it shows here is if the warfarin is less than five milligram, actually the effect to the babies is actually not too bad. So if you can see here, if it's less than five milligram, okay, your number of healthy fetuses is actually quite high. So basically what they did was they examined 28 uh, patients and these 28 patients had differing doses of uh, warfarin, okay? So if it's less than five milligram, you see high percentage of them have healthy fetuses and the fetal complications are less. And in fact, you're looking at WE, which is warfarin and bryopathy. If it's less than five milligram, there's no fetus with warfarin and bryopathy. However, 
If you increase it to more than five, immediately you can see that the number of healthy fetuses reduces and your fetal complications increases, so as uh, so your warfarin embryopathy as well. So that summarizes my second study. So now we know there are different anticoagulant regimes with our patients who have mechanical heart valves. Uh, we know that now we can safely use low molecular weight heparin provided we actually measure both the peak antitenin and the trough levels. Okay, so for higher risk patients, okay, we may want to consider warfarin and warfarin is actually not too bad, especially if your the dose is actually less than five milligrams. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to my third case. Okay, so this is Madam WYL. She's a 41 year old Gravida 3 Parazole plus 2 at 26 weeks, 5 days. So this lady, she's got a DCDA twin pregnancy following IVF with two embryo transfers done. Okay, she's got diabetes, uh, gestational diabetes on treatment. Uh, her sugars are well controlled. Uh, so basically, this lady presented with a one week history of pruritus over bilateral extremities worse at palms and soles. Okay, she denies any rashes of fever. She's got no pill colored stool or tea colored urine, and she's not on any supplements and traditional medications. So what I would like to highlight with this study is whoever coming in with the pruritus, uh, we have to have our different diagnos differential diagnosis. And one of the thoughts are basically obstetric cholestasis. But with obstetric cholestasis, always remember it's a diagnosis of exclusion because um, we made the same mistake as well with this case study because what happened was we thought it was obstetric cholestasis and we sent all the investigations. And finally, when the results came back, it was actually uh, EBV infection. Okay, So uh, as much as we have started also the acid, acid uh, when we got back the results, uh, what we realized was uh, we didn't really need it. And true enough, the bilacid, serum bilacids came down and this patient actually um, progressed quite well. Okay, the reason why we need to know this is because uh, osteoporosis is a diagnosis of exclusion. We wouldn't want to simply jump and diagnose someone with OC and then uh, basically uh, intervene early and deliver her early based on that diagnosis. Okay, and pardon me, I mean, obstetric pulses is actually a, 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 a whole term. So now we are actually moving on and calling it intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy uh, instead. Okay, so the discussion points I would like to bring up uh, with this case study is uh, a few recent developments with regards to its management, okay, of uh, OC, uh, intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy. So role of measuring bile acids in intrahepatic uh, intra cholestasis, okay, is it uh, really helpful? Uh, does bile acids uh, prognosticate the fetal outcome and maternal outcome? Timing of delivery, okay, with patients with intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy. Can fetal death be predicted and prevented? And is active management of delivery at 37 weeks for these patients really necessary. So just a quick recap on intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Again, I can't stress enough that it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, pruritus and jaundice, although rare, may precede biochemical abnormalities. So if you have someone coming in with an itch, okay, and all the blood investigations are normal, so don't be too reassured. Make sure to keep this patient in check and follow them up because sometimes what happens is the investigations can only be normal after a few weeks. Okay, maternal and fetal monitoring. Uh, yes, we agree. Serum measurement of LFTs and serum biases is important to monitor the mother. Fetal monitoring. Um, the role of ultrasound and CTG is not exactly very good in prognosticating the fetal outcome. Uh, that's why decision for an optimal timing of delivery is actually quite. Um, Difficult. And this is something that I will discuss further in uh, to my presentation. The treatment options very quickly are uh, their symptomatic treatment and also the use of other medications. So the only ones that we actually find quite useful is actually uh, you know, ursodeoxalicylic acid, which uh, some clinicians use up to 500 to one, 500 milligram and one gram twice a day. So what it does is improves pruritus decreases elevated liver enzymes and bile acid levels and improves fetal outcome, okay? Um, uh, so what, this is basically a randomized scroll trial uh, to actually show uh, the effect of ursodeoxalic acid versus placebo in women with uh, intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy. So this is a very important trial that we need to know, which is the PITCHES trial. 
So what it shows here is, although the use of ERSO is actually quite safe in pregnant women, it is not effective in reducing adverse perinatal outcomes, okay? So what this study shows is, the routine use of ERSO deoxylate acid should be reconsidered. In fact, uh, some, uh, some centers are also moving forward and using the reformed in addition to ERSO deoxylate acid for patients with severe intrahepatic cholestasis. So this is a paper uh, published in the UK. So what they did was they find that adding rifampicin uh, on top of ursodeoxicolate acid can actually um, help uh, with the management of uh, uh, these patients. Okay, as you can see here. So I would just like to bring your attention to this uh, second graph on your right. So what it shows here is basically your X x-axis is the medication, okay, so pre urso acid, and then when you add rifopacin, okay, and this y-axis is basically your bile acid concentration. So, <coughs> excuse me, as you can see, the moment you add on rifopacin, the serum bile acids reduces quite tremendously, okay, so they concluded that the uh, addition of rifopacin can actually uh, help with the management of patients with severe intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy. In fact, there's a actually clinical trial in Australia, which is also examining uh, this uh, effect. However, uh, the, the study is still ongoing and we don't have the results uh, as per now. Uh, so, pardon me. Okay. So basically, I'm just gonna move on. Uh, to the timing of delivery, okay? So uh, should women be offered early elective delivery? Okay, so the general agreement suggests that delivery for these patients or patients with intrahepatic uh, cholestasis in pregnancy should not be delayed after 37 to 38 weeks, okay? However, we have to bear in mind randomized clinical trials to support active management in these patients are lacking, okay? So the numerous report cited uh, in support of active management is actually flawed by lack of control populations. They failed to adjust for the background stillbirth rate, and they failed to exclude cases with comorbidities known to be independently associated with higher stillbirth rates. Okay, so what is being practiced all over the world? So in the UK, um, they don't give very specific uh, plans, okay? So they say a discussion should take place with women regarding induction of labor after 36, 37 weeks. They do not endorse routine active management for this patient. In Australia, again, not very obvious um, guidelines, uh, not very uh, straightforward guidelines. Rather, they plan, they say plan delivery if diagnosis of OC is established at or close to term. In Singapore, again, active management delivery before 36, 37 weeks, but they don't specify when, okay, though they acknowledge that this is uh, at the expense of increased obstetric in intervention. So only in Australia, uh, in uh, US, they were quite um, straightforward and they were quite specific in actually intervening. And they said they go by serum bile acids, the total serum bile acids. So anything between 40 to 99 micromoles, per liter, they deliver between 38 and 39 weeks. If your total serum bile acid is more than 100 micromole per liter, they deliver at 34 weeks. Okay, so how did they come up with this very bold guideline? So I think it's because it's based on this study. Basically, it's a Lancet study, okay, in published quite recently in February 2019. It's a systemic review uh, examining the association of adverse perinatal outcomes of intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy with biochemical markers. So what they found was the risk of stillbirth is increased in women with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy uh, when serum bile acids are more than 100 micromole per liter. Okay, so as you can see here, I would like to bring your attention to this graph here. So basically these different colored lines are your uh, total bile acids and your x-axis is the gestation, okay, from uh, zero weeks to 40 weeks, and your y-axis is the percentage of stillbirth, okay? So if the total bile acids is more than 100, is the red line here. So what you can see is when your bile acids is above 100, okay, your risk of stillbirth increases quite tremendously, okay, across the gestation compared to if it's less than 40 or less than uh, uh, 99, 
Okay, so this is how they came about advising active intervention for patients who have total serum bile acid of more than 100. Uh, figure over the right here, as you can see here, your excess is your gestation, more than 100 is the line in red, and the risk of spontaneous preterm birth as well is increased if uh, increased most when uh, your bile acid, total bile acid is more than 100. So that concludes my uh, uh, third study. So basically the interpretation of this study is uh, because most women with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy have bile acids below this concentration, they probably can be reassured that the risk of stillbirth is similar to that of a pregnant woman in the general population, provided that you follow up this patient with serial bile acid, okay? So, um, the take home messages uh, for my whole presentation is with the first case, bear in mind that when managing patients who has had uh, MI prior to a pregnancy, PCI or rather your angiogram, angioplasty is not a contraindication of pregnancy. It's actually quite safe. Okay, when you have a patient with mechanical heart valve, uh, using low molecular weight heparin is actually something that's quite safe, provided that you measure both the peak levels and the trough levels, right? And if you're planning to use warfarin, especially for patients who are at higher risk when they're using the older generation valve, if there's um, double or triple valves that is affected, if the patient has got uh, an underlying atrial fibrillation or have previous history of thrombosis, you may want to consider warfarin for the patients. And if the warfarin dosage is less than five milligram, this, uh, the effect to the fetus is actually quite minimal. Uh, and with the third case uh, study, my take home message for that, uh, that presentation was always remember intrahepatic cholestasis is a diagnosis of exclusion. Do not just jump to the diagnosis because the last thing you wanna do is intervene uh, when it's not necessary. So with that, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your concentration. Thank you.